All right, guys, let's learn a little bit about Bohr models. So here's your traditional model of an atom. That is until this guy, Niels Bohr, came along and was like, nope, that's not correct. Niels Bohr looked at the model of an atom and he wasn't too happy with it. He said, hey, look, the center is made of positive charge because there's protons in there. Neutrons don't give it any charge, but the positive protons are in there. If you look at the outside, there's electrons and they're negative charge. Shouldn't they come together because opposites attract and kind of phase out of existence? So Niels Bohr wasn't really happy with that. Now he was thinking of a better solution and he was looking at colored fire and thought, hey, if you look at different colors, they're caused by specific atoms. For example, lithium always glows red and potassium always seems to go purple. He was also talking with some of his astrophysicist friends who were looking at the stars and they learned that stars emit certain frequencies of light called an emission spectra. And if you look at that emission spectra, you can actually see specific atoms in those stars emit certain frequencies of light. There seemed to be consistency among the atoms. So Bohr made his own model, and here it is. He suggested that atoms, electrons, have to stay in specific energy levels. Kind of like you see in this model over here, that there's low energy levels closest to the nucleus, and the farther you get away, the higher the energy levels. Now, electrons typically like to stay in low energy levels, but they like to, they can jump, and they do that either by receiving or losing energy. He suggested that colored fire was caused by this exact thing. By giving electrons energy through heat, the electrons would jump up to a higher energy level. And then they wouldn't want to stay there. They'd eventually fall back down. And by falling down, they would lose energy in the form of light of different colors. Now, the different colors were explained because different elements have different amounts of energy levels and electrons, and they jump at different frequencies in different ways. And so we get a large spectra, even though each element has a specific signature, kind of like a fingerprint. So how do we draw a Bohr model? Well, first, we need a little bit of information, and we're going to pull it from the cards on the periodic table. Here's one for carbon, for example. Now, if you look, each piece of that card has specific information like there's the atomic number, the element symbol, the name, and the atomic mass. Using that information, we can figure out how many subatomic particles an element has. We'll start with the number of protons. It's probably the most important number, and that's equal to the atomic number because protons give an atom its identity, and this is always true. Now, how do we find the number of neutrons? Well, a little bit, it's a little bit more complicated, but we're going to take the atomic mass. And if you remember, the mass is the nucleus of the atom, which is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So if we take the atomic mass and subtract out the number of protons or the atomic number, then we're going to get the number of neutrons that are left over. Now, this is for the average isotope. Not all atoms weigh the same, but the average ones are the ones that are shown on the periodic table. How about the number of electrons? The number of electrons is equal to the number of protons typically, but that's only if the atom is neutrally charged, which is how we're going to treat them at the beginning of the semester. Okay, so let's talk about drawing Bohr models. You see over here, there are some, there are some rules. I call this the board game method. We're going to treat the periodic table kind of like a board game. Now, similarly, similarly to when you start playing a board game for the first time, sometimes reading the rules are a little bit overwhelming and they're not understandable. So go ahead and write these down. You might consider pausing the video to do so, and then we're going to actually use these rules in action to figure out how the game works. But really quickly, the energy levels of an atom, the different rings, are designated by the row number the element is in. The electron placement for each of those rings is determined by each of the element spaces in each of the rows, which we'll show you. There are a few special rules. One is for the transition metals when we get to those green ones. And then finally, the lanthanide and actinides at the bottom. When we reach those spaces, there's a few rules such as dropping down one energy or dropping down two. And I'll show you an example in that, of that in a minute. So let's see the board game in action. First, let's start with with uh, carbon, because we've already done that one. Here, I'm going to start with the nucleus of the atom. We saw that the atomic number is 6, which is the number of protons. And then the atomic mass is 12. So we're going to take that 6 and add another 6 to get a total mass of 12. And that's the number of neutrons. Now, where is carbon on this periodic table? It's right here. And you see it's in the second row of the periodic table, even including that big gap. So we're going to put two rings or two energy levels for carbon. Now, how about placing those electrons? Let's start with our board game piece. Typically, you start at space one. So we're going to use each of these element squares as a different space to place our electrons. So I'm going to start at the first space, and we're going to put an electron on the first energy level. And then I'm going to go to the next space, and I'm going to put electrons on that energy level. Now, notice that the next space I go to is in the next level. So I'm going to go up a ring and place the next electron there. And I'm going to continue along this trend, placing the second, the third, and finally the fourth 
electron on that second energy level. And that's it. We did it. We built the Bohr model for carbon. We see that there are two low energy electrons and four high energy electrons. Congratulations. All right, but the game does get a little bit more challenging when we get to the transition metals and the lanthanide and actinides. So let's deal with that. Let's see an example here. So here's an example. Let's use arsenic, for example. Arsenic, as we see, has 33 protons. That's its atomic number. Now, if we take 33 and we figure out how many the rest of it gets to 75, which is the atomic mass, it's 42 neutrons. And so we have the nucleus right now. Now, arsenic is found right here on the periodic table. That's four rows down. So there are four rings in the Bohr model of arsenic. Now let's start filling in those electrons. Again, we got to start at space one, so let's do that. One, two. Two electrons go on the first energy level of arsenic. Now we're going to go to the next energy level and start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight electrons go on the second energy level of arsenic. Okay, let's go to the third level. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight electrons on the third energy level of arsenic. Now we're going to go to the fourth level. This is where it's going to get a little bit more complicated, so pay close attention. We're going to start by placing two electrons in the fourth level. But now we've reached those transition metals, the green elements, or the elements that are lower on the periodic table. These elements... When you reach them, their electron position falls back one level. So I'm going to change my piece to red, and notice that in the example, there's a red electron that's not on the high ring, but on one ring lower. So now I'm going to keep going. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So here we see that on the second energy level, there's the original eight, but there are also ten new ones with totaling of 18 electrons on that level. Now we're getting out of the transition metals and back to normal elements. So let's go back to the top row and add one, two, and three electrons. And congratulations, we just reach arsenic. So we're done with this single player board game of building boar models. All right, congratulations. You're going to do this a lot better if you guys get a lot of practice. So good luck.